Well, good evening, friends. Welcome once again to our final events of Bible Prophecy Seminar. Tonight's topic is a very, very important topic. It's also a very interesting topic. It's called the Great Judgment Day. I want to begin tonight by reading from our Bibles, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Open your Bibles tonight. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. It's a text that we've been looking at quite often through our series of meetings. And we keep coming back to these three angels' messages. And this first angel has something very interesting that says, or what it says bounces us into our topic of the great uh, judgment day tonight. Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 6. The Bible reads as follows. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Here's that famous message. It's going to go to the entire world just prior to the second coming of Christ, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And verse 7, notice what it says. It says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. This is a message going to the world prior to the second coming of Christ. And the message is that the judgment of God is come. In other words, the judgment of God is on. Now, if we are able to look at that verse tonight and say, well, this message is going to go to the world before the second coming of Christ, that means the judgment of God begins before the second coming of Christ and the message will go to the world to prepare for that judgment day. We must be able to somewhere, somehow in the word of God, work out when the judgment day of God begins. You know, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, Paul here in the book of Acts gives us a little bit more information about the judgment day of God. Acts 17, verse 30 to 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why does he do this, friends? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. The Bible tells us here that God has appointed a day, a set time, in other words, when the judgment shall begin, in which he will judge the world. God has a set time. The hour of his judgment has come. A day appointed to judge the world. There's a set time in the stream of history somewhere where God will begin the judgment of this world. There was a time in the past, God says in Acts 17 there, where he winks at the ignorance of man, the ignorance of their sins. But he commands the world today to repent because there's a day appointed by God for judgment. Now, Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 7 saw in vision the great judgment day of God. Notice Daniel chapter 7, looking at verse 9 and 10. The Bible reads, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened." Notice, my friends, what the Word of God says in that particular passage, a vision that Daniel saw. He saw the thrones of, of heaven placed there. The Ancient of Days, God, sat on those thrones. Thousands upon thousands of the angels were there ministering. The judgment was set. And friends, the Bible says that the books were opened. The books of record, the record of the history of this world, the record of our lives will be opened in this great judgment day. Friends, what a solemn thought that is. What a solemn day it will be when man has to give an account to God for the lives that he has lived. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 tells us also something interesting. A very simple verse of scripture, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Friends, every one of us on this world shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There will be accountability for the lives that we have lived, for the opportunities that we have had. Now, what will be the standard in the judgment? If you go to the courts of the world, there has to be something you are judged against. Isn't that right? There has to be laws. What does the Bible say will be the standard in this great judgment scene that will take place? Notice James chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It tells us quite clearly what the 
the, uh, the standard will be in the judgment of God. James 2 verse 11 and 12 says, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Here we find James, he quotes a couple of the Ten Commandments and says, So speak and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Friends, the law of liberty is God's great moral law, His Ten Commandments. In that great judgment scene, when the books are opened, the standard, friends, will be the law of God. And we've seen in our previous lectures, night after night, the importance of the commandments of God, not to be saved by our works, but the definition of sin is the breaking of God's law, His commandments. Now we find when we get to the judgment, the law will be the standard that we shall be judged against. Now how specific will the judgment be? Is God just going to look at our, our lives in a broad sort of a spectrum here or is he going to be very specific? Notice the words of Jesus as Jesus talked about the great judgment day. Matthew 12 verse 36, he said these words, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Here we find Jesus says the judgment day, friends, is going to be very specific to our very words that we have spoken. Our actions are going to be recorded. The words have been recorded. Our thoughts have been recorded. Our motives have been recorded. And we shall meet that again. Friends, God won't let this world go without accountability. Many in our world may live their life and think, well, I'm going to just die. And, and one, one man said once to me, so I'll die and I'll just push up daisies. But friends, we can live a life that may be wicked and sinful, but God will bring us into accountability for our life. There will be a great judgment day. Now, the question at this point is this. So far, we've seen very clearly from the Word of God in a nutshell, there's going to be a great judgment day. We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But the Bible told us back there in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, that the hour of God's judgment is come, a message going to the world calling to prepare because it's judgment day. Now, of course, the question has to arise from this point. When does the judgment begin? As we've already mentioned, we know the judgment begins before the second coming of Christ because when he comes back to this earth, the Bible says he's going to come back and his rewards will be with him. Now, to understand this great topic of the great judgment day, we have to understand a little bit about the Old Testament sanctuary service. Way back in the Old Testament there, God established what is known as the sanctuary or the temple. And through that temple service was typified the plan of salvation. In Psalm 77 verse 13, the Bible reads, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. In other words, the whole plan of salvation is through the sanctuary service. It typifies what takes place in the plan of salvation that Jesus Christ fulfilled. We go back to the Old Testament, to the book of uh, Exodus. We find there the children of Israel. The children of Israel, they went down to Egypt. They became bondmen. They became slaves to the pharaohs of Egypt. And eventually God delivered them from Egypt by a mighty hand, the mighty hand of Moses. He brought them out of Egypt towards the promised land. They went through the Red Sea. God brought them to Mount Sinai. There he gave them the Ten Commandments written with his own finger on tables of stone. And he also gave to Moses at that same time some blueprints, some plans for the sanctuary. How the sanctuary should be built, how the services would work right down to the last nut and bolt as it were. And to understand the great judgment day, we have to understand how the old sanctuary service worked is it typified the plan of salvation now if we look at this bit of video footage on the screen here we find in a nutshell what the sanctuary was all about we find that the sanctuary was made up of first and foremost a courtyard around the sanctuary in that courtyard there was the altar of sacrifice there was also in that courtyard the wash laver but as you now go into the sanctuary itself as our video shows it pulling apart there, we find there was two apartments. The first apartment was the holy place and the second apartment was the most holy place. Now, the most holy place in the sanctuary was the holiest place in the earth, on the earth, 
to the children of Israel. Right there was the visible presence of God. In that apartment was one piece of furniture. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. It was basically a, a box, a golden box. In that golden box was placed the Ten Commandments of God. Above that box, on what was called the mercy seat, there was a light. It was actually the visible presence of God, known as the Shekinah glory. When the high priest, once a year, went into the most holy place, he actually came into the visible presence of God with the Shekinah glory. This place was so holy that no man could go into that place without losing his life. The high priest would only go into the most holy place one day in the year to make an atonement for the children of Israel. What would take place through this sanctuary service? Day by day, the sinner would come to the sanctuary. He has sinned. He'd committed sin. He would bring a sacrifice. He would bring the lamb. He would bring the lamb to the sanctuary. He would confess his sins on the lamb. Once he had confessed his sins upon the lamb, the lamb was slain and some of the blood was caught. The priest would then transfer that, that, uh, that blood and the sin that was transferred through the blood. He would take some of that blood into the sanctuary, into the holy place. And day by day throughout the ceremonial sanctuary year, the sins of the people were symbolically accumulating in the holy place of the sanctuary. This would take place day in and day out. But there was one special day in the year when the sanctuary was to be cleansed from the sins that were placed there day by day. It was called the Day of Atonement, the great Day of Atonement when the sanctuary was to be cleansed. It was also known as the cleansing of the sanctuary and it was also known as the Judgment Day. It was their Judgment Day. In Levitic Leviticus 16, verse 29 to 30, the Bible talks about this great Day of Atonement. Notice what it says. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. You see, friends, the day of atonement was the day of judgment. It was the cleansing of the sanctuary. The children of Israel were commanded by God to confess their sins, to afflict their souls, to search their hearts, to make sure that they were prepared for that day. And for those who wouldn't get involved in the Day of Atonement, the Bible says that they were cut off from Israel. If they weren't afflicting their souls, if they weren't confessing their sins, they were cut off from Israel and they put Israel into two camps, the righteous and the wicked. And this, my friends, was known as the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now keep in mind what I've just mentioned here. This is going to become very important as we go through our topic now because we're going to find that the cleansing of the sanctuary or the judgment day back in the old sanctuary service is what takes place in our, the rest of our lecture tonight. It helps us understand, unravel the mystery of the cleansing of the sanctuary and when the judgment day begins. Now let's get back to our question. Our question we started with a little while ago was, when does the judgment begin? Can we tell when the judgment of God is going to begin? Because we should be able to, because the Bible has already told us the message will go forward, the hour of his judgment has come. Can we tell when the judgment of God begins? We can. And the first thing is, I've mentioned it before, it is before the second coming of Christ. Some Christians have the idea that the uh, great judgment day of God will take place after the second coming. But the Bible gives us two reasons why it has to be before. Firstly, because there's a message going to the world that the hour of God's judgment is come, it's on. And secondly, Jesus comes back to this earth with his rewards to give to people. Notice Matthew 16, verse 27. It says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. When Jesus comes back, friends, he comes back to reward every man according to his works. Therefore, prior to that, there must have been a judgment. So we know the judgment will begin before the second coming of Christ. Now we're going to study right now in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, the longest time period given in the prophetic books of the Bible. In Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9, we are going to establish from these two chapters 
two incredible points. The first point is we're going to establish when the judgment of God begins. God has told us that. And we are also going to establish the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the world. You know, friends, there's many in our world today that are waiting for the Messiah to still come. But the, books of, the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and chapter 9, tells us clearly that Jesus Christ could be, the Messiah could be no other than Jesus Christ himself. There is no other Messiah to come. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And friends, we'll soon find out why I say that. Now, we have been studying the book of Daniel and the, the book of Revelation quite a lot through this series of meetings. And we find now in Daniel chapter 8 that Daniel has a vision. Daniel chapter 2 we've studied. Daniel chapter 7 we've studied. Now in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel has another vision. In this vision, he sees a, he, a, uh, a ram. This ram has two horns. One horn is higher than the other. And as he's watching this ram, it's pushing westward and southward and northward. And as he's watching the ram, he sees out of nowhere comes a he-goat. This he-goat comes across the face of the earth so fast, it doesn't even touch the ground. It comes against the ram, it attacks the ram, and it kills the ram. Daniel said the he-goat that he saw had a great big notable horn between its eyes. And as he was watching the he-goat kill the ram, it killed the ram, and after he watched that take place, he saw that the great notable horn was broken off. As this horn was broken off, as he was watching in vision, he noticed four other horns come up in its place. And then from those four horns, from one of those horns, comes a little horn that grows exceeding strong and powerful. And the vision finishes with these words in Daniel chapter 8, looking at verse 14. This is the, the last words of the vision. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, friends, we've learned already something about the cleansing of the sanctuary, haven't we? It's something to do with the great, the, the great day of judgment. And, of course, Daniel hears those words. He hears the words, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, of course, Daniel was thinking to himself when this finished, the same as you and I are probably thinking to ourselves, well, what does this mean? Obviously, this vision has something to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary and the day of judgment. But what does it all mean? What was taking place in Daniel's vision? We find as we go on now from verse 14, that Daniel hears a voice, a voice that comes from heaven. And it calls out to a person or an angel called Gabriel. Gabriel, we understand from the scriptures, is probably the highest angel in heaven. And notice now what verse 16 says as Daniel looks at this, as he continues hearing after this vision. Daniel 8, verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So here we find this, this voice comes out and the voice is a call to Gabriel. And Gabriel is one of the highest angels. He said, Gabriel, make this man, make Daniel understand the vision. So Gabriel now begins to help Daniel understand this vision. And in our next verse, verse 17, we find out our first clue to what this vision was all about. Daniel 8 verse 17 says, So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Here we see Gabriel says to Daniel, Daniel was fearful because it was an angel. And he says to, Dan, uh, to Daniel, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. In other words, this vision isn't just a local thing that's going to happen in, a, in the next couple of years. This goes to the end of time. This is a long period in this vision. Now, of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, what was the vision really all about? The first thing we have to try and identify is these two beasts, the ram and the he-goat. Now, in previous lectures, we've had to go to some lengths to try and work out what these, this Bible imagery is all about. But we find here, it's a very, very easy one to work out because Gabriel, the angel, just tells us who they are. Now, of course, we know in Bible prophecy that a beast is a kingdom, nation, or a ruling power of some sort. But we find here in verse 20 and 21, 
the Gabriel just tells us who they are. He says to Daniel, the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. These are two of the same world powers we've seen in the past, Medo-Persia and Greece. It's very interesting here because the ram, which was Medo-Persia, had two horns. One was higher and larger than the other. Remember back in Daniel chapter 7, there was a bear raised up on one side. It was Medo-Persia as well. It was a coalition dual empire. The Persians were the strongest. That's why it's called usually the Persian Empire. But we find here also this he-goat with this notable horn. And the Bible says the he-goat is Greece and the notable horn is the first king. Now, of course, we know the first king of Greece, the one that brought it to power, was the great man of Alexander the Great. And it's interesting because as Daniel saw this vision, he saw the great horn was broken off and four other horns came up in its place. And we learned in our previous lectures as well that those four other horns were the four generals of Alexander that took control of the empire after he died, sadly, at a very early age. Now, Gabriel goes on here. He just keeps explaining to Daniel the whole vision. He says it very, very clearly. It's Greece. It's Medo-Persia, first king, more kings, horns. He explains the whole vision to Daniel as clear as crystal. And he gets to the end of his explanation looking at verse 26 and verse 27, and he now gets into the 2,300 days. Notice Daniel 8, verse 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I arose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Notice Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. It reads as follows. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So Daniel's praying, and all of a sudden, who turns up? Gabriel turns up, who he saw in the vision at the beginning. What vision was that, friends? the vision of the ram and the he-goat in the 2,300 days. Verse 22 goes on and says this, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Verse 23, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. He says to Daniel, understand the matter, consider the vision. What vision is he talking about, friends? He's talking about the vision of Daniel chapter 8. Isn't that right? The reason being why he's come back is because he didn't get time to explain to Daniel the 2,300-day prophecy and the issues surrounding that, and now he's come back to give him that extra information. Gabriel explains about the 2,300 years and the cleansing of the sanctuary. That was the last thing that he said to him before he fainted. So now keep in mind that we are talking really about the 2,300-day prophecy, but Gabriel now breaks it down into segments because there's more important information for Daniel and friends, for you and I to understand right now tonight of what this time period is all about. Now notice the very next words of Gabriel. We've got to really be putting our thinking caps on now. We're going to go into some timelines and some, some uh, time periods I'm going to try and go as slow as I can so we can all get this into our minds and understand the clarity and the power of this prophecy. Daniel 9 verse 24. Now Gabriel goes straight into giving some more information about the vision. Daniel 9 verse 24, the Bible reads, Gabriel speaking. He says to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. The first thing that Daniel was told now he says, Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Now that word determined in the Hebrew is chathak. It means to cut off. 70 weeks are determined or cut off or allotted for thy people. They've been cut off from what? From the 2,300 days or as we know in Bible prophecy, 2,300 years. He says to Daniel, Daniel, your people have got 70 weeks. They're cut off for your people and for your holy 
city. Now, we have to ask ourselves here, well, how long is 70 weeks? What is Gabriel trying to get at here? If we look at 70 weeks and we calculate that together, if we look at 70 weeks and we go seven days in a week, so 70 by seven days in a week, it gives us 490 days. Now, of course, we know in Bible prophecy that a day represents a year, so we're really talking about 490 years. Gabriel said to Daniel, your people, the Jewish nation, you've got 70 weeks or 490 years allotted to you in your sanctuary, in your city. Now, 490 years were given to the Jews, but what for? Why was Gabriel saying this? You see, while Gabriel is speaking to Daniel, the city of God, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary has been annihilated. They're captives in Babylon. Daniel's been praying about going back and getting his people back to Jerusalem to build the sanctuary and to have freedom for their, their worship once again. And now Gabriel says, Daniel, your people have got 490 years. You've got 490 years basically as a second chance to get yourselves right. Because of your apostasy, because of your rebellion against God as a nation, you are in captivity. God will bring you out of captivity. He'll give you a second probation, a second chance of 490 years. Now, of course, when it comes to any time prophecy, you have to have a starting point. Okay, the Jewish nation was going to be given 490 years, but when would it start? When would the 2,300 years start? Well, friends, we don't have to wait very long to try and find this out because now Gabriel tells Daniel the starting point for this prophecy. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, we find here that Gabriel now goes on in the very next verse. In verse 24, he said, Daniel, 70 weeks, 490 years is for your people. And he gives us now in the next verse, verse 25, he gives us the starting point. Notice verse 25 now. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Daniel was just told by Gabriel, the starting point for all this, Daniel, is this. When the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem goes forward, when this takes place, this is the beginning of the 490 years. Now the question, of course, is, well, when did the decree go forward to rebuild Jerusalem and the sanctuary? The decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given in the year 457 BC. This is one of those undisputable historical facts. In the year 457 BC, Artaxerxes of the Medo-Persian Empire, the king of the Medo-Persians, made that decree to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, it tells us that he issued this decree in the seventh year of his reign. And it's an undisputable fact that he began his reign in 464 BC. So if you minus, because we're going BC here, if you minus 7 from 464 BC, it brings you to the year 457 BC. And this is our beginning point for the 2,300 years and also the 490 years. But notice now what the rest of verse 25 has to say. Let's go back to verse 25, Daniel 9, verse 25, and let's read the entire verse again and find out another important point. Daniel 9, verse 25, the Bible says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, which is 457 BC, this is the part we read just before, so from 457 BC, notice the rest of the verse now. Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, the angel Gabriel's making us think a little bit here because he breaks down now the 70-week prophecy. He says, from the going of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, 457 BC, unto Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, threescore and two weeks. Now, how long is that? If we have a look at this, we find that seven weeks, of course, is seven weeks. Three score weeks, a score is 20, so three 20s is 60, 
and two weeks. So we have seven, 60 and two. It's 69 weeks. So Gabriel is telling us here, the Bible is telling us here, from 457 BC, it will be 69 weeks or 483 days or years unto Messiah the Prince. Now, friends, this is something very, very incredible in the Word of God. We are finding here 500 years before Jesus Christ was born, before the Messiah came, that God told the people of God, the Jewish nation at that time, and put in His Word the very year we should be looking for the Messiah. 483 years after the decree of Artaxerxes goes forward, Gabriel just told Daniel, Messiah the Prince would arrive. Let's have a look at the chart now on our screen here. Look at this chart. And let's put this into a chart format. Here we find the, the uh, decree of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, goes forward in 457 BC. Gabriel just told us that 483 years later, it would bring us to Messiah the Prince. 483 years added to 457 BC brings us to the year 27 AD. In the year 27 AD, Bible prophecy tells us 500 years before the event that the Messiah has to appear somewhere, somehow in the year 27 AD. Now the question, of course, friends, is this. What happened in the year 27 AD? What happened in that year? where we should be looking for the Messiah to appear. We find the evidence for what happens in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Notice what happens in the year 27 AD. Luke 3, 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Here we find 483 years from 457 BC brings us to 27 AD. In the year 27 AD, friends, we find at that point of time, Jesus Christ is being baptized, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the, in the form of a dove, and there's a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Friends, right to the year where God said the Messiah should appear in 27 AD, we find Jesus being baptized. He begins his three and a half year ministry to this world. Friends, that is, to my mind, absolutely incredible. God has predicted the very year the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would begin his work. Now, of course, we have to ask ourselves a question here. How do I know that the year that Jesus Christ got baptized and began his three and a half years of ministry, how do we know it's 27 AD? We find it is 27 AD from this point. In Luke chapter 3, we just read the verses about Jesus Christ being baptized. In verse 1, the chapter starts like this. And it's very interesting. Sometimes you read the Bible and you think, why does God put that sort of information in the Bible? Notice what verse 1 says as it starts in, in Luke chapter 3. It says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. This took place in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Of course, he was the Caesar that was ruling at the time. Now, friends, it's an undisputed historical fact that Tiberius Caesar began his reign in the year 12 AD. That's when it took place. But the Bible tells us here that when Jesus got baptized, it was the 15th year of his reign. So friends, if you and I add 15 to 12 AD, it brings us to what? It brings us to the year 27 AD. Friends, the year that Jesus got baptized is exactly what the Bible said it would be. It was 27 AD. And you know, friends, after he was baptized, Jesus did something. The Bible tells us he was baptized. He went into the wilderness of temptation for 40 days. He came out of that temptation victorious against Satan. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it tells us exactly what he did. Notice these words. It's incredible. It says this, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God 
and saying, notice these words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. In 27 AD, Jesus Christ was baptized, proving, my friends, without a shadow of a doubt, he is the Messiah of the world. After he was baptized, he goes off to Galilee, goes to the world. He begins to preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he begins by saying the time is fulfilled. Friends, what time was fulfilled? The time prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Jesus Christ understood the time prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. He realized he was baptized right on time. He realized his mission to go forward to the world and to preach. And he begins preaching by saying, the time is fulfilled. Friends, Jesus Christ is the Messiah of this world. This is one of the most beautiful prophecies and one of the most accurate prophecies in the Bible. And it proves that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. There's no other being on the face of this earth that has come or will come in the future that can be the Messiah of the Bible other than Jesus Christ. And the saddest part of this whole story is that you have a Jewish nation that to this very day is still waiting for the Messiah to turn up. They were told by, by the angel Gabriel through Daniel that the very year they should be looking for the Messiah. And when he turned up, they missed it. And today, friends, to this very day, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. But he came nearly 2,000 years ago. He performed his work and was victorious as the saviour of this world. It's really one of the saddest prophecies, one of the most exciting, but at the sad time, one of the saddest because it's so clear, it's so precise. But the Jewish nation, because of their blindness, because of their rejection of God and their sin, they missed the opportunity of preparing themselves for that Messiah. So here we find up to 27 AD, we have covered 69 of those weeks where Gabriel said, Daniel, your people have 70 weeks. We have now covered 69 of those weeks, 483 years. But there's one week left, one prophetic week left in this prophecy. One prophetic week or, or uh, seven literal years left. Notice now as it goes on, what happens in this last week? Gabriel now continues to explain to Daniel what takes place in the last week. Notice now Daniel chapter 9, looking at verse 26, what the Bible has to say. After three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Friends, the Bible tells us here, Gabriel said that the Messiah after 27 AD would be cut off, but not for himself. What does that mean? What does it mean to be cut off, but not for yourself? Verse 27 goes on and says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst or the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Here we find this last week that is allotted to the Jewish nation. The Bible tells us that during this last week, the Messiah would be cut off. What does it mean for the Messiah to be cut off? How, friends, does the Messiah get cut off, but not for himself? What does it mean? Well, friends, it doesn't matter what we think it means. What matters is what does the Bible tell us that it means? Those very words being cut off, we find those words in Isaiah 53. Now, in Isaiah 53, we have another incredible prophecy of how the Messiah would come and how he would suffer and he would be smitten for his people and he would die for the transgressions of each one of us. But notice what Isaiah 53 in verse 8 has to say about this cutting off, what it means. Isaiah 53 verse 8 says, He talking about the Messiah. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Here we find the Messiah, the Bible tells us, would be cut off out of the land of the living. What does it mean, friends? It means the Messiah would somewhere, somehow die, not for himself, but friends, he would die for the transgression of his people. Friends, that's you and I. This prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 tells us that the Messiah would come in 27 AD, but that he would sometime after that die for the transgression of his people. He would cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Let's go back to our chart now. and Let's have a look on the screen here and put these uh, time periods together. Our 483 years brought us to 27 AD, when Jesus was anointed as Messiah at his baptism. 
Now, in the middle of this week, this last seven years, the Messiah would be cut off or he would die. <clears throat> if we add three and a half years to 27 AD, it brings us to 31 AD. What happened in 31 AD? It is in 31 AD, three and a half years after he began his ministry, that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He was nailed there not for himself, but for his people. He was cut off from the land of the living. Remember, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 said, In the midst or the middle of the week, he, the Messiah, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. How did Jesus cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the middle of that last week? It's simple, friends. He died on the cross of Calvary. And when Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, there is now no need to have sacrifice and oblation. You know, it's an amazing story. The Bible tells us when Jesus was nailed to that cross, it was the Passover week in the sanctuary service. As Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross, as he was dying on the cross, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as he was dying there for the sins of the world, as he was being cut off from the land of the living, back in Jerusalem in the temple in the sanctuary, we find the priests have got the Passover lamb and they're about to sacrifice that Passover lamb. When the real Passover lamb was nailed to the cross outside Jerusalem on Calvary's hill. And the Bible tells us here in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 51, it says these words. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Jesus Christ is nailed to the cross. As he dies, he yields up the ghost, the Bible says. At the same time, they're about to sacrifice the Passover lamb in the sanctuary. And the massive curtain of the sanctuary, which historians tell us was as thick as a man's hand, was just torn in half, symbolizing that the sacrificial service, the sacrifice and the oblation has now ceased. Friends, there's no need for you and I to go and sacrifice lambs anymore because the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, was nailed to that cross, not for himself. He was cut off out of the land of the living, not for himself, but for you and I, my friend. But Jesus Christ had died. And friends, the sacrifice and the oblation has ceased. This brings us to the year 31 AD when Jesus Christ died on that cross. But now, friends, this is only the middle of that last week. There were seven years. Three and a half years brought us to Jesus Christ dying. There's still three and a half years left. And we go back to our chart here, and if we add those three and a half years to 31 AD, it brings us to AD 34. What happened in AD 34? We find in AD 34, there was the close of the Jewish probation. That last week of those 70 weeks that was given to the Jews finishes in A.D. 34. And in A.D. 34, friends, one of the saddest stories on earth takes place is that the Jewish people were cut off from being the people of God. And the incredible part with this prophecy was that Jesus Christ died three and a half years before this point. But God's love for his people was so strong and so great. His patience is so long that he still gave them three and a half years after they crucified him to repent and become his people. Jesus Christ said to his disciples before he left this world, go to my people. Don't go straight to the other uh, Gentile world. They were to start there in Jerusalem trying to win the people of God. There was still hope that they could become the chosen race and take the wonderful message of the crucified and risen saviour but we find at the end of the three and a half years in 34 AD they sealed their fate when they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7 we find the sad story of the mighty powerful man of God Stephen as he's preaching to the Jewish leaders he's trying to convince them that Christ was the Messiah that they've crucified their Messiah to repent and the Bible says that those Jewish leaders went crazy and the Bible says and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here's Stephen preaching to the Jewish leaders. They stopped their ears, the Bible says. They rush upon Stephen and they stone him. 
And as he's being killed, as it were, as he's being martyred, he says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. But friends, probationary time for the Jewish nation is fast running out. And when Stephen was stoned, we go now into chapter 8, verse 1, which is the next verse. It says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Therefore they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Here we find, my friends, at the stoning of Stephen, 34 AD, the great persecution that comes on the, on the church scatters them abroad and they begin preaching to the entire world. The gospel, my friends, is now taken to the Gentile world. The Jewish probation sadly has closed and the 490 years is finished. And Israel sadly ceased to be the repositories of God's truth and it is now given to the Gentile world or to the Christian church, we could say today. Let's just go back to our chart on the screen now and summarise the entire 70 weeks. Have a look at this on the, on the screen. Let's, let's get the big picture here so we don't get ourselves confused. The Bible said 70 weeks are determined for your people, which was 490 years. We find that it began in the year 457 BC with the decree of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, Gabriel said there would be 483 years that would bring us to the Messiah, the Prince. This brings us down to the year 27 AD when Jesus Christ was anointed at his baptism as the Messiah. There were still seven years or one week left. That last week was cut into two parts, two three and a half year periods. The first three and a half years would bring us to 31 AD when the Messiah would be cut off, when the sacrifice and the oblation would cease. And the last three and a half years brings us to the year 34 AD, which was the, the last three and a half years of those 490 years where we find the close of the Jewish probation. Now, you and I, friends, so far in this lecture tonight, we've only dealt with the first 490 years of a larger period that it was chathak or cut off from, from the 2,300 years. Now, we go back to our chart here and we look at the, the 2,300 years, beginning in the year 457 BC again, with the decree of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and we add... 2,300 years to 457 BC. It brings us to the year 1844. 1844, we are told there will be the cleansing of the sanctuary or it would be judgment time. Remember Daniel 8 verse 14. And he said unto me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And 2,300 days or 2,300 years brings us to the year 1844. And in 1844, my friends, we are to find the cleansing of the sanctuary. And of course, the cleansing of the sanctuary, we understand to be the judgment day. But there's a bit of a problem here. In 1844, where was the sanctuary of God on this earth? You see, friends, in 1844, there was no sanctuary, was there? The sanctuary was destroyed by Titus in 70 AD, about 40 years after Christ was on the earth. Ever since that time, there's never been a sanctuary. The Jews have never had a sanctuary on this earth. But the Bible tells us in 1844, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Well, what sanctuary is to be cleansed? You see, friends, we find something interesting here. That is this, the little sanctuary that Moses was commanded to make, that God gave him the plans for, was only a little model, a little replica of the sanctuary that God had already made in heaven. Notice what the Bible tells us here in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister, verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. The Bible tells us very clearly through the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is now the high priest, that the sanctuary that he ministers in isn't the sanctuary on this earth, but it's the sanctuary in heaven 
that God made and not man. You see, friends, the model of this earth, that little sanctuary that Moses made on this earth, was only a model of the real one in heaven. And what took place through that sanctuary service was going to be typified through Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation. And right now, today, Jesus Christ is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Notice also Revelation 11 verse 19. Talking about, once again, the heavenly sanctuary. It says this, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. John saw in vision the temple, the sanctuary in heaven, open. He saw the ark of the testament. Revelation 15 verse 5 also tells us something similar. After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Friends, there's a sanctuary in heaven. Jesus Christ is the high priest. And so we look at this great day of atonement in 1844 when the Bible says the sanctuary would be cleansed. What's being cleansed? Not the earthly sanctuary, because there is no earthly sanctuary. It's the heavenly sanctuary, friends, that is being cleansed. In other words, we're going into the day of atonement in 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary, which in other words is the day of judgment. Friends, in 1844, in the heavenly sanctuary, we have now gone into the final judgment day of God. 1844, the judgment of God began. The cleansing of the sanctuary, friends, represents the final judgment taking place in heaven. And this great judgment day begins in the year 1844. Acts chapter 17 said, God's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. And friends, we have now learned that it began in 1844 and it's been going for the last 150 years to the day which you and I are living. Nobody knows how long that judgment will go. But we do know it will finish with these words from Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Verse 12, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Here we find that great judgment day, friends, will finish with that record. He that's holy, let him be holy still. He that's unholy, let him be unholy still. And behold, I come quickly, Jesus said, and my reward is with me. Why? Because there's been judgment taking place. And God will judge and reward every man according as his works shall be. Friends, you and I today, what is the important part of this lecture? The important part of this lecture, my friends, is that you and I today must be making sure that we are right with God. We should be putting sin out of our lives, preparing for our names to come up in the great judgment day of God. What Daniel saw there was real, friends. The thrones were put in place. The ancient of days, God did sip. The books were open. And the judgment was set. Why is it important for us to understand this, friends? It's important because we have a message in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, the first angel's message. And that first angel is giving a message to the world that the hour of God's judgment is come. Let's look at that verse one more time on the screen. Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Friends, it's very important for you and I to know when the judgment begins, because if the judgment hasn't begun, the three angels' messages shouldn't be preached. But now the judgment began in 1844 and this message is going to the world that the hour of God's judgments come. Worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, the fountains of waters. Get your life right. Put away sin from your life. You see, back in the Old Testament times, friends, they were commanded to afflict their souls, to search their hearts, to prepare for the judgment or they were to be cut off. And friends, each one of us today should be searching our hearts. God is giving this message as a warning, not to put fear into us, but to arouse us to the great event that's taking place in heaven. And friends, right now today, you and I, each one of us, as the Bible told us, shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And friends, I don't know about your life, but I know my life. And I look at that great judgment day and I look at my name coming up in the judgment scene. The books of record are opened. My page is turned. And the Bible tells us, friends, that we have an adversary. It's called, he's called Satan. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He's accusing before God as those names come up in the judgment hour. There's Rikus's name. You can't let him into heaven. Look at the page. Look at the sins of his life. The great standard in the judgments, the law of God. Satan points to that law. He points to my life. He points to my page and says, you cannot let him in here. He's broken the commandments of God. Friends, every one of us will face that judgment. Every one of us will face that judgment without any hope of getting through. The accuser will be saying to God, the God of heaven, and he's saying it truthfully, isn't he? I mean, Satan tells lies, but in this case, he's just saying the truth. He's saying you cannot let them into heaven. They've broken the law. They're sinners. The wages of sin is death. How can you let them back into heaven and kick me out? Friends, each one of us right now, as I'm speaking, we have no hope of passing through the great judgment day of God safely. The, accus the accusations of Satan are true. But the Bible gives us hope. And the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Friends, if Jesus Christ had not come to this world, if he had not been cut off, not for himself but for his people, we would come into that great judgment day without a hope. But the Bible gives us hope tonight, friends, because the Bible says if any man sin, and that's every one of us, if any man sin, we have an advocate, we have an intercessor, we have a lawyer, as it were, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, friends, Jesus Christ has paid the price, hasn't he? You know, in our world today, there's these, these lawyers that seem to be so skilled at getting off these criminals, even when they've committed the crime. And each one of us, friends, we're like those worst criminals. But Jesus Christ wants to be our lawyer. He wants to be our intercessor. He wants to be our advocate. And when Satan is accusing you and I, as the, the picture on our screen shows us, pointing to us, saying, God, you can't let this man into heaven. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He'll hold up his nail-scarred hands. He will say to the Father, this man, this man has repented. This man has confessed his sins. I have paid the price. I am requesting, Father, that you put beside this man's name, price paid in full. He shall live because I have died. And friends, Satan cannot argue against that because the price has been paid. Friends, Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins tonight. He's pleading with our hearts, let me be your advocate. Let me be your intercessor. Let me be the lawyer in your life that's never lost a cause, a case. And friends, how is it with you today? How is it going to be when your name comes into the great judgment hour? Will Jesus Christ be your lawyer? Will he be your advocate? Will he be your saviour? Friends, I pray and hope that you reach out to the hand of Christ today as he wants to be that lawyer in your life that's never lost a case. You know, in conclusion of this whole lecture tonight, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14 sums it all up. It says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Friends, God is telling us the conclusion of the whole matter is this. Fear God, keep his commandments, because everything is coming into judgment, whether it's good, whether it's evil. Evil. And friends, Jesus Christ wants to be our advocate tonight. He wants to get that big rubber stamp, as, it, as the picture on the screen shows, and put next to our name, paid in full. He's paid the price. He was cut off not for himself. He was smitten for the transgression of his people. That's you and I, friends. And tonight, won't you reach your hand out to the hand of Christ? Won't you reach your hand out to a loving saviour who wants to be a lawyer that can't lose your case because he's already paid the price? And the ultimate question as we close tonight, friends, is this. What will your verdict be? Will it be guilty or will it be not guilty? May God bless you as you 
seriously digest these thoughts tonight. And I encourage you, friend, tonight, take the hand of Christ. Let him be your lawyer. Let him be your saviour. Let him be your intercessor. Our next lecture, as we continue on in our final events of Bible Prophecy Seminar, is called In Search for the True Church. In Search for the True Church. Now, of course, the question many ask today, why is there so many churches? Couldn't it just be one? Make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? In Search for the True Church. Who are the two women of Revelation? Who are the remnant? How to be part of God's people at the end of time? That's tomorrow night. May God bless you. And may you come back tomorrow evening as we continue on in our final events of Bible prophecy. May God bless you and good night.